Gusti hoy. Eh, bueno, en el papel ahora en Isangoda. So my role now was to, to, to chair this session. So let me introduce the new panelists as defined. The name is panelist or respondent. I don't really know what the name is. But actually, they will share their view, their approach to this uh, topic, the impact of digital health on real integration and results for patients and the patient experience. And so they will give us a significant opinion and also related to previous pan panelists or lectures. And they are Shane Fitch, founder of the Love Exer Foundation, working with uh, lung disorders, respiratory disorders such as COPD, or much more common diseases or minor diseases such as alpha-1 antitrypsin deficit syndrome. And they've been working for over 20 years in this setting with several different missions, solutions such as digital solutions, digital health solutions, or the professional patient relationship, patient empowerment and training, etc. And this complicated relationship between patients and healthcare professionals. Then we have Ster Sahuaya, trained in social psychology and pedagogic teaching. And she's got previous experience in social work in social work, sorry, with city councils and work with the Catalan government, discussing strategies. And then she's now working at Tanstal and Televida, managing digital solutions there. So she will bring her own life experience from the field of the, the company and, uh, and that field, but also this, the pre, her previous social um, grassroots uh, work. And then Vinan Yona, very active uh, man in social media, with a long experience in training in, in this field of digital health, worked many years at ATSLEC, which is an entity bringing together labor organizations. Uh, he's been a tech consultant, as he is doing now, and also intensively in the training sector, he has led several seminars. I, I actually was at one of his seminars, and I can say that he truly fights for keeping us trained, even though we're reluctant, we have to say, but he gives us the training we so very much need. Again, very active in social media. And then his view as a patient is also very important. He is diabetic. Uh, type 2 diabetes, and he's been to Osaki Decha, active patient uh, activities, also with uh, Chronico Saria that worked uh, in the field, and so he can uh, share his experience. Shane, five minutes age, and they will share their idea. Hello, everybody, and um, I'd just like to, to reiterate a few things that came out of um, both of the excellent um, presentations that we had today. And, and, and the context has changed, so the context has changed very fast, and it continues to change fast in how a citizen considers that they are going to engage in looking after their health and social well-being. Not so much for the older generation, and the real burden of costs is there, of course, at the moment. Um, there's also misconceptions about the older generation's willingness or capability of adapting to technology, which persists inside the healthcare system, more than outside of the healthcare system. And in our experience, we have managed to work very well with older people, always when we create a relationship with someone. So it's about the relationship. It is about the social dialogue and the dialogue that you can have with a healthcare professional when you have the time. The problem is the time. 
And the time is the fact that is being more and more eroded in the opportunity to engage with any healthcare professional in any setting, you know, even online, let's be honest. We're not going to transfer a 20 minute consultation offline to a 20 minute consultation online because it has the same cost. So we have to find new ways of creating an environment where the citizen engages with the healthcare profession, but they share relevant data. Because if the data is irrelevant, it has no value either to redesigning or configuring a, a care plan that suits that person. So the benefits for all is essential. From the administrator of the um, healthcare centre to the healthcare professionals that are working in it at different levels, from primary to tertiary, as we say in Spain, um, and to, to the patient or caregiver that's engaged. So all those people, all those stakeholders have to get a win-win out of the information that's shared from the data that's provided and the data that's measured, what is measurable from that context. And it is more, much more sophisticated. Yes, it's challenging, but we already know with big tech, they've done a lot of the work for us. They are making tech low cost for us. It shouldn't be any more than the cost of a Spotify account to manage a chronic care patient anymore. Less when you get real economies of scale. So what you need to do is look at those care models that you can kick off with, you have to kick off somewhere that are integrable, that are interoperable, that are flexible, that can be used in different contexts and go for it, really. But change your communication package because actually there's a huge slab of communication that is necessary in this to gain trust, to gain confidence, to get the behaviour change. And behaviour change is perfectly possible, you know, from social work. You can achieve it, but you need the tools to do it and you need the educational materials, you need the right language, you need the right technology. The way a young person engages is totally different from someone who is older. And they can do it very fast. They can do audio with Google to put in their digital health record. That IT is available, we should be using it, right? <laughs> Update daily, two or three minutes. How are you feeling, what are your symptoms? Whether it comes from your wearable, which is connected, or yes, my own point of view, how I'm feeling. You know, I'm going to leave that. Then you can apply the big data realistically to good quality data. But otherwise, how are you going to apply big data to old data that is incorrect, that's been stored in filing cabinets for hundreds of years? That's crazy. You know, so re-engineering systems is a little bit dangerous. It doesn't necessarily have a, have a good outcome. I think that, you know, uh, we have to be bold enough to say, no, we can, we can bring in new tech, we can look at the context, we can do this. And big tech, you know, they can help. They've got all the social profiling that we need, which will help to get that personalised plan. So you identify who you're dealing with and you have a different relationship with them. Yeah. Uh, so thank you. Thank you for all your all, all your thoughts. Um, actually, it's an absolutely pleasure to to have the opportunity of sharing some of my thoughts, particularly with people in the stage with whom uh, I've been having uh, so many discussions, particularly in the Scotland in the Scottish strategy. So from um, from an industry perspective, um, or at least from Tansel's perspective, uh, that we do for the ones that you don't know, we are a company that actually what we do is to provide services and solutions for making sure that people can live where they want to live as long as possible with the best quality of life possible. So for a company like ours, um, actually our aim is to support systems to support healthcare professionals, to support providers, to do things differently. And do things differently, mainly, yeah, can you please move to the, yeah, the, uni, the next slide, that was uh, like the summary. So do things differently, actually, um, means providing value to the people, and it was very much highlighted by, by, by Julio, and I 100% agree with this idea of providing value as providing better quality, better outcomes, better use of resources, and better experience of care in this triple M uh, perspective. So what, 
what we wanna what we wanna highlight in this few minutes is that for us uh, we strongly agree with the panel with a, with the keynote speakers that technology has to be an enabler for these value transformation so we are able to provide much more proactive preventative uh, integrated and comprehensive care at the community level uh, mainly but obviously we need to face some challenges to adopt uh, technology in our daily in our daily life and uh, some challenges are very much um, present in all of our all of our countries so we've heard uh, during the conference a lot about how we how we improve our transferability uh, so the transferability from IT solutions but we all want to co-create so then how we find the balance between co-creating what's particularly designed for me and for my context but without inventing the wheel all the time so where's where's the where's the balance between creating new digital solutions for my particular context or adopting others that are already validated, tested, solved and co-created by others. So how we do legitimate others uh, co-creation, I'd say. But uh, in a way, um, providing this uh, value to patients, providing value valuable care to users, professionals, actually it's the only way that we can, um, we can sustain our system, so it's very much also oriented to uh, the, 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 so the sustainability of our systems. I wanted to come in a couple of use cases that I think it, it, it demonstrate that technology as a technology enabled care services uh, can actually contribute in this population based approach. So uh, how we overcome, and that was another second thought, uh, how we overcome pilots, trials and yeah, to be honest, research and development projects and how we adopt those into the mainstream of our general practice, uh, hospitals, social care uh, settings or nursing homes. So at least in Spain, there's a long tradition on providing uh, proactive and personalized uh, telecare that's been uh, presented here today by Betillon, the Basque country. Um, and just one data, uh, so one, one um, information on that. It's, so only with this proactive and preventative uh, telecare, advanced telecare service, uh, our customers are able to, so the final users are staying now four years, four, four years and a half using the service. Whereas when we have telealarm, let's say, that's very common in other European contracts, uh, countries, uh, people were staying at home with preventative and community services only for not, not, not even three years. So actually the impact that it's having in the entire system and the sustainability and more importantly, the possibility, given the possibility to the final users to remain at home, uh, it's, it's, it's a major uh, consideration to, to have in mind. And the second use case that I would like you to Google it into the internet because I, I find it very, very valuable is how Calderdale uh, Clinical Commissioning Group with 38 nursing homes, 1,300 1, uh, users, how they've managed uh, to actually reshift all their model of care uh, with multidisciplinary teams, with clinical telemonitoring, with IOT in the care home and integrating electronic health records. So that that means for me that we need to understand that those are multi-level uh, strategies, multi-level, so complex interventions, that it's not like what we can do in one research project that we try to find evidence for uh, one limited intervention, but we need to understand it as a complex, complex project. So. Um, Basically, that was what I, I was very much uh, looking forward to share with you. Hola, buenos días. Good morning. It would seem that I... Um, well, I'm an ordinary person. Uh, I'm a worker, I'm a patient, I'm a professional. And uh, I'm kind of an outsider here. Um, You've been speaking about innovation, economy, management, but I don't see that you're focusing much on patients themselves. Um, we're all patients. 
all individual, individuals are or will be patients in the future. I uh, got to know uh, this, feel, this feel thank to uh, the uh, initiative SAREAN, an initiative where um, patients were asked, how do you feel today? And it was a, a project where patients supported by the uh, Basque Health Service could express the fears they could um, meet similar individuals. Um, they would feel um, good with and uh, they could uh, speak uh, freely. Um, I was diagnosed uh, as having type 2 diabetes later and um, this initiative um, of the Basque Health Service uh, had finished, but there was another one called uh, Paciente Activo, meaning active patient, which is also a meeting place where uh, a community is built upon, where voluntary people are trained to support other people uh, that are in their same situation uh, so that they um, can know more and manage uh, their condition by themselves. Any patient can ask uh, to participate and engage in this initiative and uh, any uh, individual uh, is free to participate. Uh, carers as well uh, are welcome to engage in the project and can uh, participate as um, mentors uh, after attending a short training course and then they can uh, engage in the workshops where um, people are empowered. I um, like it when you mention older people. I like to call them seniors, meaning that they have a broader experience. It doesn't mean that they cannot uh, use uh, the media. My mother is a diabetic and uh, she has an iPhone and she uses her smartphone, a WhatsApp application, and um, she's very active in social media. So anyone can use a social media and a smartphone and uh, a digital device. We only need to make their lives easier and help them use these devices. So in this case, the initiative um, I would like to mention, because it's an initiative I myself I'm engaged with as, with as a writer um, and active patient is um, this initiative where we want to set up a network where people can come to and participate in order to know more about their own condition, about uh, their own fears and uh, meet similar people to them. Uh, it's not like going to Dr. Google and uh, reading something um, written by I don't know who, uh, motivated by I don't know what. We don't know if behind that there is a laboratory or someone lying, which is sometimes the case and it was the case concerning vaccinations. Uh, there are many websites um, telling us many things. And then we don't really hear experts in the matter. So we want to set up a network um, based on social media where um, the people intervening in the process are, i.e. patients. Um, so that patients feel comfortable with peers and where we have some um, uh, practitioners, physicians, nurses, etc., but not sitting behind a desk but rather sitting next to them uh, and speaking over the internet, if necessary, maybe using Instagram. Why not? If we have to be, there will be there or Facebook. Why not? All this is pretty much related. Uh, if we ha there could be issues related to uh, privacy, but we'll sort them out. But if we have to be on the internet, we'll be there. Um, at the end of the day, you know, people trust and believe the person that is close to them. I ask you and you give me your opinion. You tell me how you've injected insulin. And to me, um, it's better to hear from you than from a nurse that may have 20 years of experience, but only has three minutes to tell me how to do it. 
So I have questions, I have fears. Where, who can I call to uh, if I don't have a practitioner at hand? Well, I call people that are in the same situation as me. And uh, you can do that over the smartphone or you can go to Dr. Google and ask Dr. Google many, many things. The problem is that maybe behind Dr. Google, you don't have a physician, you have someone just telling something that may not be trustworthy. So we need to someone uh, to have someone to uh, talk to i am a diabetic so it's my mother my father has uh, alzheimer's disease he he has a very uh, um, terminal or advanced condition i don't know if he is actually my father any, uh, anymore well he's still there some uh, somewhere and my wife has um ms but we live our lives um daily day by day and we have assumed we have these conditions and we trust uh, the practitioners that provide uh, care and we trust them and we of course want to engage in the control of our condition and that's all for me thank you so much Muchas gracias. Thank you. Thank you very much, Benen. Thank you, all three of you. I think there's some time for questions for now. About 10 minutes, am I right? Just before we move on to uh, ask the audience what questions that they have for our great speakers and panelists this, this morning, um, I'd like to say that following this plenary session, there will be a celebration of where we're going next year and the lunchtime sessions will start once we've had that celebration. So please don't depart the room to go into your lunchtime sessions until we've had the celebration. Thank you. So um, can I ask if there's anybody that would like to pose a question to one or all of our uh, speakers? Can you identify yourselves, please? Hands up. No questions? <laughs> okay. Bueno, mientras, eh. Let me break the ice. I've been uh, jotting some notes uh, and uh, they're saying I would like to highlight uh, the importance you have given to time and uh, choosing the right technologies, uh, uh, for instance, with the young people, the younger generation that uh, demand the right technology. Um, Esther, I would like to highlight the term you use, co-create, um, which is very relevant as well, and a population-based approach that uh, you highlighted. And concerning Venan, uh, who is here as a patient, he uh, de focused on patients and he um, provides much importance to the relationships between uh, patients and uh, um, that methodology. Um, I don't know, this is my own summary of uh, what's been said so far and now, of course, the floor is yours if you have any questions or comments. So, picking up on, uh, I think, Julio's point, uh, we need to think differently. Has the, the speakers not inspired you to think differently and come up with a question? Surely somebody would like to pick these good All people's... Right. I have a question. Can I see? Hello. Yeah. Uh, my name is Patrick. Thank you for the panelists. Um, I appreciate both the talk about the technology, but also the importance of uh, thinking differently. So on that point, um, does anyone want to talk about uh, what we need to do to um, help make uh, what the key is for overcoming our challenge with sharing information in electronic systems? Because we've done it for over 20 years now. And uh, um, in particular, I think when we talk about the problem as designing a health information system, the the focus always seems to be on designing and coding the right thing, but maybe some insights about 
looking at it not as an information system, but as a way to change how we interact or how to bring in patients differently, that that would be a different way. So I'm just wondering if a shifting our mindsets away from the technical part to more of the social part would be helpful. Yeah. Hello. Sí, sí. Bueno, yo creo que hay que darle al paciente datos. Hay que permitirle al paciente. Um, so, <laughs> allow the patient to actually have the data, might get around some of her governance issues and major barriers. Um, taking that ownership and allowing them to share with whoever they want. Um, we all know that the security of data has been dealt with, you know, we look at banking as a good example and open banking as, as a progressive example. So we don't fully understand. We think it's a, a change. We think it's also attached to risk and liability because the data is so sensitive. But if you give the patient the data, then it's their choice if they want to share it with their neighbourhood and their community. Uh, sorry. Uh, I couldn't agree more. Um, electronic health, care, health records, whatever we call it, are broken. And uh, they were designed with a different mind map and for different purposes. Basically, uh, because the business model for vendors and for the system as a whole. Um, so we are paid because we generate uh, notes and uh, discharge reports. So what do we want? Something that help us uh, do that. Um, like, like a faster horse instead of a car. Um, so that, that's the problem. The problem is the business model and how we, we thought about um, translating uh, paper work into uh, an electronic model. And, and the context is different. But, but we don't change the way we think, because when I criticize electronic healthcare records, many of my colleagues um, tell me, are you suggesting that we should go back to a paper? No, that's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is this, this does not work anymore. It consumes time. It doesn't allow patients to communicate with us. Healing starts with communication, not with data storage. So that's the problem. We need to change how we think about healthcare records. Yeah. Um, uh, oh, sorry, I was going to add on. We've got to... one down here and one question uh, over here, please. I, that's a really good point, and I think. Um, around that thinking differently we have to think about how do we build different relationships between the care practitioners and their users um, because the traditional way of interacting isn't the right one in a digital yeah. enabled world we change the words but that doesn't mean a thing that exactly. doesn't work yes. it's not about the words it's about how we think and then we'll translate that into words yes. not all the way around yes Thanks. Thank you very much, panel, for a very interesting session. Um, IFIC this morning has just launched a new special interest group on small island systems. And clearly, digital health has a huge opportunity to enable integrated care in small island systems. Would the panel members have any insights or advice on building the business case in the context of small islands in Scotland or in Southern Europe. And if anyone wants to show interest in the small islands system, SIG, then please come to the IFIC desk at lunchtime. Uh, well, uh, I, I'd just like to say, and, and a little bit continuing on, we do have GDPR now, which actually has given ownership to people on their data. So we are not without resources to work more effectively in the digitally enabled environment. And from the patient perspective, 
Um, it's wonderful to have environments where people engage and discuss their issues, but we have to remember that those environments are not secure environments for sensitive data. So from a patient organization perspective, in our case, we decided to take on the challenge of being a custodian of sensitive data so that we could act in the social environment with a determined level of conversation, but also when we want to manage sensitive data, we can do that in a secure space. So they, these are different digital environments. I know from the Digital Health Institute, you've already taken on that board. You have a different communication in a different environment. And it can be, it can be merged and it can be brought together so that it's useful for analysing and for really understanding how to get better personal treatment, better outcomes for patients, better and a better management tool for healthcare professionals. Regarding um, an uh, comment on uh, small islands, uh, definitely I would need some more time to think about that uh, particular business case, but uh, what I think we would agree is so everything that can be done and shared between that local area and outside the island. So I mean, all that getting from outside also remote tele, um, non-face-to-face -face consultation, providing support both to professionals or people who is living in there. I guess that's, a, that's a, an ideal context for, as, as, as you've done in Scotland or in Australia, some, some rural areas where all that has to do with telehealth, telemedicine, inter-consultations between professionals. I guess that's like the ideal environment for pushing that uh, new model of delivering uh, care, but that's the only thing that comes to my mind at this point. Yeah, I suppose one point with regards to business case development with, uh, you know, any, any of this is actually the uh, readjustment of budgets. So depending on what innovation or intervention you're trying to develop through your business case, a lot of the time when I talked about shifting the balance of care from treatment to prevention or treatment to independent assisted living, it's all very well, but if the business model is still paying 95% of that big budget to treatment, you don't have much to play with with regards to the, the prevention and the fringes and the independent assistive living. So I think any business case has to make sure that that kind of joint budgets, which I know Scotland has now got through the integrated joint boards, is taken into account. And that we realise that actually innovation sometimes has to run in parallel. So we have to still have the old system working while the new system emerges. Um, and I think a lot of business cases um, are a little naive to think you can actually s completely stop doing something one day and start doing the new system the next. I would like to ask, add something. Um, we must stop over-diagnosing and over-treating those who don't need it just because they're there and they, and they show up. We do things to them and then use those resources to those who are under-diagnosed and under-treated because they don't show up, because they're far away. Uh, we need to understand that first, and, and then to reallocate resources. So, so we are uh, fair uh, in dealing with budgets. Thank you, Julio. I think we'll move to the last question now before the celebration. Okay, um, Helen Housen from the Bevan Commission. And I would like to endorse the need for us to think differently and to think much more clearly around the what and why of this. Um, I, I can see the need to, to delve into this in detail, but I think we're in grave danger of losing sight of what it is we're trying to do. And in particular, the bit that miss is, is missing for me is about people. Uh, people either make or break some of this, whether you're a professional in the system or whether you're a person, a, a member of the public or a, a patient. And the bit that I think is missing is around behaviour change. We assume, we make assumptions about people's ability to do this, to, to use it and to use it and apply it, whether you are the patient or whether you are a, a member of the public or a professional. I think we ignore this at our peril. 
<laughs> um, I, I, I like to agree with you. I think that most of our work is revolving around behavior change so much for the healthcare professional to adapt to a new way of engaging with the patient as much as the patient to understand what kind of data is important and how they can self-care in a different way that it contributes to their relationships with the doctor. Um, so getting people into this, and it really is independent of age, it's a whole cultural shift. There's a lot of work in education and communication that needs to be done in that area before we get or achieve anything like the kind of transformation that we expect to have in the next five to ten years. One more comment from the panel. I suppose to, I absolutely agree, um, change management across the board, whether you're in health or social care is lacking. Um, the change managers are just not there because they weren't employed to be those people. They were employed to be nurses, they were employed to be doctors or social workers. They weren't actually employed to do things differently. Um, so it does take a, a certain kind of person um, that is creative, but also it takes a structured piece of work for the government or the, the local areas to educate and actually empowering people to be allowed to change. So I think absolutely um, it's a big gap. So on that note, thank you very much. I think we, we should go away from here today thinking that We've been stimulated to think differently across the board and hopefully in this last plenary um, how digital, digital health solutions can actually support us to think differently in our journeys to deliver person-centred integrated care for the citizens in all of our regions. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Very good. Very good.